Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Artistry regrets that it was unable to host the Voice to Vision art exhibition scheduled to be on view in the Inez Greenberg Gallery April and May 2020. However, we still want to share this immensely worthy project. Although in this video we focus on just a fraction of the overall number of V2V artwork, we hope this format allows you to immerse yourself in the stories of these five survivors and the resulting art. Enjoy the exhibition. Founded nearly 20 years ago by University of Minnesota professors David Feinberg and Dr. Stephen Feinstein, Voice to Vision, or V2V, is a collaborative project that captures the extraordinary experiences of genocide, war, and migration relocation conflict from different parts of the world. The development of the artwork, only a fraction of which is being shared in this virtual exhibit, began with storytelling sessions and conversations between the survivors and a team of visual artists, writers, and interpreters when needed. Together, the V2V cohorts transformed these stories and ideas into paintings, drawings, collages, and mixed media artwork reflective of each voice involved. While shedding light on the horror of war, the stories and the resulting collaborations reveal the magical powers of love and humanity. Gina Kugler was 14 years old when she boarded a train with her mother and father. They were told that they were being relocated to a different ghetto. Snow fell as their journey progressed. Gina's father was familiar with the tracks, and he alerted everyone on the train car that the train was headed for the death camp in Treblinka. Panic ensued, and with their parents' blessings, the older children who could get through the small windows of the locked cars jumped off the train as it passed through the dark countryside. Kugler recalls, I forgot to turn around and say goodbye. Thirteen children jumped off that train and never saw their parents again. The Mothers of Soacha, or Las Madres de Soacha, is an activist group of women from Soacha located on the outskirts of Bogota, Colombia. After their innocent children were murdered in the false positives, los falos positivos, these mothers refused to keep silent. They formed an activist group to fight for justice against the government, despite receiving death threats from soldiers. The false positives occurred from roughly 2002 to 2010 in Colombia during the Civil War, and involved corrupt government soldiers tricking and kidnapping impoverished civilians and turning them in to increase their body count, which increased their pay. The numbers are still unknown, but it is believed that roughly 5,000 people were killed in the false positives. The Voice to Vision team members traveled to Bogota in the spring of 2018 to interview six of these women. Each triangle in the painting Madres de Soacha tells one of the women's stories and includes imagery they drew themselves. The triangles together form one circle to represent how their stories are forever connected. One of the mothers of Las Madres de Soacha is Luz Marina. Luz is a descendant of farmers. In the top image, she depicted a field scene, which was where her son was assassinated. On January 8, 2008, her 26-year-old son with special needs went missing. His name was Fair Leonardo Pral Bernal. Military personnel were hired for $70 to assassinate him. They asked him to follow them as an exercise, and he did. They walked for 20 hours through the mountains into another city and into a field. They took everything off of him, all his papers and documents. On January 12, 2018, he was assassinated. They put his body in between the fields in between the corn and the tomatoes. On May 14, 2009, Six military personnel were put on trial for forced disappearance and homicide, intention to kill, and falsifying public documents. The brown line in the drawing represents the walk of the trip to another city, a very long journey. She chose the color green because it signifies hope, and she believes as a mother she cannot lose hope to find her son. She believes she saw him once, but it wasn't quite him in a dream. She hasn't ever been to the site of the assassination, but she's going to go this year. In the bottom image, Luz Marina drew a plane. 
This plane represents all the trips she has taken to other countries in order to find out what happened to her son, as well as speak on behalf of the mothers of Swacha. She has been to Quito, Minneapolis, New York, Mexico, Canada, Spain, Oslo, and Cuba. The green is to represent hope in the grounds that they land in. Hope is what they are bringing. Sarah Schwatt was born in 1940 in German-occupied France. Her father and mother posed as Catholics while being members of the French underground. During the war, Sarah's mother sewed resistance armbands, which is why an image of a French underground armband is pictured on the right side of the artwork, with a sewing machine underneath. Oddly, the mayor of the town knew that her parents were part of the resistance, but he didn't report what he knew, even though his wife was working voluntarily as a Nazi official. In the center of the piece, Sarah placed a fraction of her mother's picture juxtaposed next to an almost full picture of her father, making one image. Sarah felt compelled to make this artistic move because, as she says, my father thought he was in charge, but it was really my mother in charge. When Sarah was four years old, a German soldier kicked open the door of her home while her mother was inside sewing French resistance armbands. Sarah approached the soldier and said, Boots, rifle, helmet, you must be a soldier. Taken with the young girl, the soldier decided not to proceed with the investigation and left. Unbeknownst to her, Sarah innocently saved her entire family from torture and death. Sarah chose the World War II German soldier figurine because its pose is exactly how she remembers the real soldier. The artwork, Cambodia, caught between an alligator and a tiger, reflects the experiences of Bukin Chun, who was imprisoned and forced into labor by the Khmer Rouge, the brutal organization that ruled Cambodia from 1975 to 1979. When the Vietnamese communists invaded, the Khmer Rouge retreated and abandoned Bun Kin and his fellow prisoners. Since Bun Kin wasn't a native of the area of Cambodia in which he was found, the Vietnamese mistook him for a member of the Khmer Rouge, and he was tied to a tree, stabbed and tortured. On the left-hand side of the picture is a drawing, made by Bun Kin, of himself tied to the tree. When other prisoners revealed to the Vietnamese that Bun Kin was not involved with the Khmer Rouge, he was untied temporarily in order to be reinterrogated. When Bun Kin realized that the Vietnamese were unwilling to release him, he made his escape, eventually fleeing to Thailand. The curved white path extending off the canvas represents this journey. Bun Kin started his painting by making a series of blue circles, which represent water. To begin the collaboration, the Voice to Vision art team selected a photograph of a drop of water and collaged it to the upper right corner of the painting. During his labor under the Khmer Rouge, Bunkin was forced to drive an ox cart, and later used an ox cart to transfer water to the other workers. The broken wheel attached to the painting reminded Bunkin of the ox cart he drove. Just as Bunkin's life was broken, so was the wheel broken and damaged. Bunkin said that the broken wheel also represents the broken lives of the Cambodian people. In the center of the painting is Bunkin's depiction of the Tome Sap Lake, a large body of fresh water that empties into the Great Mekong River. Bunkin painted the lake red because human corpses had been disposed of in the lake. The corpses are represented by Bunkin's drawing of a skeleton at the bottom of the painting. The only blue remaining on its lake is the title written in Cambodian. Above the lake is a sign with Cambodian script in red and green. The original green letters denote a school. Later, under the Khmer Rouge, the letters on the sign were simply written over with the new functionality of the facility, Interrogation Center. Paul Bashaw left Ethiopia in secret as a young adult during the Ethiopian Revolution because of war. He knew he was being watched and targeted, and he knew he needed to flee. He arrived at the Ethiopia border checkpoint disguised as a shepherd with a group of farmers. A guard knew he was fleeing, but let him pass the checkpoint anyway. As he was traveling to Sudan, he met a farmer that told him how to avoid frontline soldiers. But Paul was still seen, and the border soldiers opened fire. It took him 45 minutes to cross into Sudan. When he arrived in Sudan, Paul was placed in detention for two months. 
After this, he stayed at a guest house for one month before traveling to Khartoum by himself with a plan to get into the United States. However, he was unable to get a visa from the U.S. Embassy because so many unprocessed refugees. People told him to go to the U.S. Embassy in Rome, but he was denied papers again at the Italian Embassy in Khartoum. He then met an Ethiopian man that knew the Italian ambassador who was able to get him a one-day non-renewable visa for Italy. Paul immediately boarded a flight headed to Rome. Paul was 21 when he finally arrived in Rome. Two of Paul's close friends that left Ethiopia before him coincidentally found him in Rome. They stayed together for one year, and then Paul left Rome for New York City. He traveled to the United States in 1979, and he kissed the ground when he arrived. Paul was sponsored by Catholic Charities through the embassy, and he was put on a flight to Pensacola to live with the family that sponsored him. Paul bonded quickly with the father of the family, but decided to move after six months. Throughout his entire journey, Paul said that he saw guardian angels watching over him. Currently, Paul lives in Minneapolis. He's in the process of publishing a book on the Constitution, and he's also running for the U.S. Senate. We want to thank the survivors for their willingness to share their stories and to the amazing Voice Division team for their creative vision and enthusiasm for gathering and facilitating the creation of such powerful artwork and the corresponding written narratives. A special thanks to Voice Division founder David Feinberg and team lead Beth Andrews for pulling the content of this virtual tour together. Please visit the University of Minnesota's Conservancy website for the most up-to-date and extensive information on the Voice Division project, including documentary videos.